Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back, Battles of America Civil War, which old Bang and Dang. Guess what we got today? We got some battles of the American Civil War. War battles. <laughs> we got some uh, Petersburg stuff, which kind of... It's pretty much the last action in Petersburg before they all uh, trench warfare until the end of the war. And then we're going to Florida for some, uh, eh, they want to take uh, Mariana, which is the uh, second largest town still head by, or held by uh, the, the Confederates at this point in Florida. And then our last battle of the day is going to be First Saltville, which is in Virginia, which is a um, a salt mine thing that the Confederates held, which also... Turned into a massacre perpetrated by the Confederates. So, yeah, lots of stuff. Uh, especially that salt bill. fucked up shit there. Um, before we get into it, go check out our YouTube at Bang Dang Network. You can get this show plus our Outlaws and Gunslingers True Crime podcast, as well as we post clip shorts, all that stuff. And then if you're, listening, or you're interested in us playing some darts and talking crap while we're at it, well... Soon, we got a lot of stuff that we got to upload on the new channel, but we made a whole new channel just for our dart stuff, Liquor Shelf Lounge Dart League, that'll be in the description, so give that a subscription, and if you're listening on Spotify, Apple, any other podcast, give us a follow, give us a review, share us with your friends, answer that Spotify question, starting off Battle of Mariana, September 27th, 1864, in the Panhandle of Florida. Mariana, the home of, Florida, home of Florida's ardent secessionist Civil War Governor John Milton, was an important supply depot and recruiting mustering center for Confederate militia and reserves. By late 1864, it was the largest northwest Florida town besides Tallahassee still in Confederate hands. July 64 raid from St. Andrews revealed the region's potential in the potential vulnerability to a larger expedition. They said, all right, we can go here. Checking it out, checking it out. 18th September, 1864, mounted column, 700 Union troops. Brigadier General... Alexander Aspoth, he was leading that. They set out from Fort Barrancas near the federal occupied city of Pensacola and rode eastward on a raid through northwest Florida. Oh, the thinly spread local Florida cavalry was unable to provide adequate warning of the size, location, and approach of the raiders. This left regional Confederate commander Colonel Alexander Montgomery. He's left guessing to as the federal objective and the strength leading to critical delays in calling up reserves and telegraphing for assistance and containing the raiders. Should have just known and just done it anyway. Just guessed. How do you know? Then you got to take people away from other places. Let's do it. Well, as the raid progressed, <laughs> the Union Cavalry fanned out, destroyed, or confiscated local foodstuffs and supplies. The federal troopers captured or scattered a small mixed company of militia volunteer Confederate Cavalry at Uchi- Uchiana, on September 23rd, to disguise his intention, Asbeth had a detachment destroyed Douglas's ferry on the Choctawachi River, closing passage along the direct road to Mariana. He then proceeded along an alternate route that would take his expedition northwest of Mariana. So we'll go around. They won't know. September 26, 1864. His mounted troops skirmished with Captain Alexander Godwin's cavalry around Campbellton, less than about 20 miles from Mariana. General Asbeth rested his weary men in preparation for a fight at Mariana the very next day. Still, Colonel Montgomery delayed uh, coalescing his forces and calling out the Mariana Home Guard. Well, this, guy, uh, this Montgomery guy sounds like a freaking idiot. Right. We don't get very much action in Florida. <laughs> Campbellton was a crossroads, so the Federals could still move into Georgia or Alabama, into the richest agricultural region in northwest Florida, or back southeast toward Mariana. They can go anywhere they want. And attempted to picket each potential route of advance with his small force, Montgomery was unable to draw his meager reserves together in strong defense of any of them. Couldn't do it. Well, well. Troops involved in this battle were for the Confederates, Chisholm's Cavalry and Company, Alabama Militia, Company C, 1st at Florida Infantry Reserves, Norwood's Home Guard, Greenwood Club Cavalry, Alexander R. Godwin's Cavalry, and the 5th Florida Cavalry Battalion. Union had 2nd Maine Cavalry Regiment, Maine, huh? Two 12-pounder howitzers, which didn't get involved at all. Um, the 1st Florida Cavalry Regiment and a detachment of the 82nd U.S. Colored Infantry, as well as a detachment of the 86th U.S. Colored Infantry. Hmm. Fantastic. Morning of 27th September. 
the old blue coats riders proceeded toward Mariana when they passed the old fort crossroads. Montgomery finally could be certain of their destination. He called out the home guard and assembled a what reserves were already on hand. Montgomery's cavalry contested the crossing of Hopkins Branch, about three miles from Mariana, with the intention of falling back into town via an old bypass, which is now Kelson Avenue, if you guys are down this area, rather than the main road. Well, in Mariana, Montgomery deployed the conscripts, militia, and home guard in ambush along the main road, which is now West Lafayette Street, for all you Marianaers. As the skirmishers at Hopkins Branch withdrew along the bypass, the home guard waited behind fences and a crude barricade of wagons and carts. St. Luke's Episcopal Church was a few feet away and would play a pivotal role later. Here, the plans of both sides ran afoul of one another. Asbeth divided his force and led the main contingent on a headlong charge down the main road. Down the main road. Meanwhile, he sent another portion of his force around the bypass along the route while Montgomery's cavalry had taken. Uh oh Seeing this and realizing his whole force could be trapped, Montgomery attempted to pull out, but it was too late. <laughs> the home guard and militia at the barricades would not budge. Unaware of what awaited him, Asbeth's wing of the attack rounded the corner straight into a scorching volley by the waiting home guard. Uh oh mm, Asbeth was wounded in the face and oh. lost many other senior officers in this volley. Despite being stunned, the Union cavalry rapidly overwhelmed the Confederate cavalry and pushed down the road in pursuit as the flanking force swept in from behind. Oh, shit. Many of the rebel troopers were able to push their way past the Union flanking force and escape, but many home guards, conscripts, and militia were pinned in town. Mm. Colonel Montgomery was captured while attempting to flee the to the Chipola River Bridge. His escaping cavalry took up positions on the other shore and were able to deter the Union forces from crossing that bridge. Mm, look at that shit. Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin B. Sample of the 5th Florida Cavalry Battalion, he rallied his men and managed a counterattack against the advancing unions. During this very attack, a bullet tore through his cheek, Jeez. but he managed to flee across the Chipola River Bridge. Being a veteran of several battles in Florida and Georgia, he was able to organize an effective deterrence against their would-be pursuers. Well, you guy. I mean, look at that shit. Well, in town, the remaining defenders on the south side of the street broke and ran, but those near the church stubbornly held out as a detachment of U.S. colored troops engaged him. Uh-oh. A dismounted bayonet charge finally forced their surrender. However... <laughs> Several Confederates continued to fire from the church and nearby homes. This led the church being uh, this led to the church being set ablaze, and the defenders shot down as they were smoked out. Oh shit! Oh, come on, guys, it's a church. Wow. Well, when the fighting had ended, some ten Confederates lay dead or dying. Sixteen wounded, fifty-four captured, thirteen of these were re were released. Really? Well, get the fuck out of here. Among the wounded was dentist Thaddeus Hentz, a son of famed novelist Caroline Lee Hentz. Oh yeah. He was shot not far from his mother's grave. Aww. Union casualties were eight killed or mortally wounded, 19 wounded, and 10 captured. Among the federal wounded was General Asbeth himself. Prior to the war, Asbeth had been a hero of the Hungarian Revolution of 1848 Jeez. and was one of the men who had surveyed Central Park in New York City. His wound would never heal properly, and he would eventually die of its effects in 1868. Oh, poor guy. Jeez. Now, due to the fiercer than expected fighting and high casualties, particularly among its officers, Asbeth's plan to turn south towards St. Andrews Bay was canceled. Instead, that evening and the next morning, the raiders withdrew towards Choctawatchee Bay. The column brought with it over 600 liberated slaves, 17 wagons filled with captured arms and stores, 200 captured horses, and 400 head of cattle. At Vernon, which I'm assuming is a city, the force overran Captain W.B. Jones' scout company, taking more prisoners. In all, 96 prisoners from the various engagements would return with the raiders. Is it? Oh. Many of these would die in prison. Oh, shit. It would be decades before this region recovered from the damage inflicted by the raid. Damn. Frickin' that up. Yep. Holy shit. I mean, uh... Okay, cool. What a mess. What a mess. So now they got access to Florida, or Georgia and Alabama, I guess? All that Is shit. Is that the reasoning for that? I'm guessing so, huh? Moving on, the Battle of Chaffin's Farm, or, nope, the Battle of Chaffin's Farm and New Market Heights, also known as Lower Hill and Combats at Forts Harrison, Johnson, and Gilmore. <laughs> this was fought in Virginia on the 29th and 30th of September, 1864. It was part of the Siege of Petersburg. From the very, 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 very beginning of the war, Confederate engineers and slave laborers had constructed permanent defenses around Richmond. By 1864, they had created a system anchored south of the capital on the James River at Chaffin's Farm a large open area at Chaffin's Bluff, 
both named for a local landowner, obviously. This outer line was supported by an intermediate and inner system of fortifications much closer to the capital. July and August of 1864, these lines were tested by General Grant in offensives designed to attack simultaneously north and south of James. Uh Uh-oh. July 27th through the 29th, Army of the Potomac 2nd Corps under Major General Winfield Hancock and Cavalry under Major General Philip Sheridan attacked Newmarket Heights and Fussell's Mill in the First Battle of Deep Bottom, which we just did, which is named for the section of the James River used for their Union Crossing. The attacks failed to break through to threaten Richmond or its railroads, but they did cause Confederate General Robert E. Lee to transfer men from the Petersburg fortifications in preparation for the Battle of the Crater on July 31st. Oh, shit. Here we go. The second battle of Deep Bottom was conducted by Hancock on August 14th through the 20th, attacking in almost the same areas once again to draw Confederate troops away from south of the James, where the Battle of Glove Tavern was an attempt to cut the railroad lines to Petersburg. I got that one. Second battle was also a Confederate victory, but it forced Lee to weaken his Petersburg defenses and abandon plans to reinforce his men in the Shenandoah Valley. Mm -hmm. Well, late September, Grant planned another dual offensive, which we'll have the first one now. Grant's primary objective was to cut the railroad supplies lines to the south of Petersburg, which would likely cause the fall of both Petersburg and Richmond. No, He planned to use the Cavalry Division under Brigadier General David Gregg and four inf- infantry divisions from the 5th and 9th Corps of the Army of the Potomac to sever the south side railroad, an operation that would result in the Battle of Peebles' Farm, which is coming up next, from September 30th to October 2nd. Once again, hoping to distract Robert Ely and draw Confederate troops north of the river, Grant ordered the Army of the James under Major General Benjamin Butler to attack towards Richmond. No, oh. right. Butler, he devised a plan that historian John Horn called his best performance of the war. Good for you, Butler. Rather than repeat the efforts of July and August to turn the old Confederates left, Butler planned surprise attacks on the old rebel right and center. His 18th Corps under Major General Edward O.C. Ord would cross the James River to Aiken's Landing by a newly constructed pontoon bridge. At the original Deep Bottom pontoon bridge, his 10th Corps under Major General David Burney would cross, followed by his cavalry under Brigadier General August Cotts. In a two-pronged attack, the right wing, which is Burney's 10th Corps, augmented by a United States Colored Troops Division under Brigadier General Charles Payne from the 18th Corps, would assault the Confederate lines at Newmarket Road and drive on to capture the artillery positions behind it on Newmarket Heights. Mm. This action would protect the flank on the left wing, which was the remainder of Ord's 18th Corps. Uh, They would attack Fort Harrison from the southeast, neutralizing the strongest point of the entire Confederate line. Uh Uh-oh. Then the right wing would assist the left by attacking Fort Gregg and Fort Gilmer, both north of Fort Harrison. Cautus Cavalry would exploit Bernie's capture of the New Market Road by driving for Richmond. Oh, shit. Got this shit all planned out, huh? Let's take a look at the orders of battle. Army of the James, Major General Benjamin F. Butler, Chief of Engineers, Brigadier General Godfrey Weitzel. You had the 10th Corps under Major General David Burney. You had a division of 1st Division is uh, Brigadier General Alfred H. Terry. He had brigades, uh, 1st Brigade, Uh, Colonel Francis Pond. He was wounded. Colonel Thomas Mulcahy. Mulcahy. Thomas Mulcahy. Lieutenant Elvin Voorhees. And the 2nd Brigade had Colonel Joseph Abbott. The uh, 3rd Brigade had Colonel Harris Plasted. They got wasted, placed it. Wasted, placed Now, the 2nd Division, under Brigadier General Robert Sanford Foster, had 1st Brigade of Colonel Rufus Daggett. He was also uh, wounded. Lieutenant Lieutenant Colonel uh, Albert Barney. 2nd Brigade had Colonel Galusha Pennypacket. <laughs> Pennypacker. Pennypacker. Oh, Pennypacker. 3rd uh, Brigade had Colonel Louis Bell. 3rd Division was very incomplete, but 1st Brigade was Brigadier General William Burney. And you also had artillery, which is uh, Colonel Richard H. Jackson commanding that artillery brigade. Then you had the 18th Corps, Major General Edward O.C. Ord, Brigadier General Charles Heckman, Brigadier General Godfrey Weitzel. You had divisions of the 1st Division, Brigadier General George Standard, Colonel James Jordan, and Brigadier General Gilman Marston, which consisted of the 1st Brigade with Colonel Aaron Fletcher Stevens, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Mulcahy, and Lieutenant Colonel John B. Ralston, Second Brigade of Brig- <laughs> Second Brigade of Brigadier General Haram Burnham, <laughs> uh, Second Brigade uh, Brigadier General Haram Burnham, Colonel Michael Donahoe, Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Moffat, who was a temporary uh, Lieutenant Colonel, and Colonel Edgar. Colon, Third Brigade is Colonel Samuel Roberts, Lieutenant Colonel Stephen H. Moffat. Then the second division of that was Brigadier General Charles H. Heckman, Charles A. Heckman, Colonel Harrison S. Fairchild, and Brigadier General Charles Heckman. 
Two Charles Heckman, <laughs> I think there's only supposed to be one of them. Right, uh, which consisted of the 1st Brigade with Colonel James Jordan, Colonel George Guillen. 2nd Brigade was Colonel Edward H. Ripley, believe it or not. And 3rd <laughs> Brigade was Colonel Harrison Fairchild. And then you had the 3rd Division, which was Brigadier General Charles Payne. Charles Payne, 1st Brigade, was Colonel John Henry Holman. 2nd Brigade is Colonel Alonzo G. Draper. Third Brigade is Colonel Samuel A. Duncan with Colonel John A. Ames unattached. Then you got your artillery with Major General George B. Cook. Then you got your cavalry with uh, Brigadier General August Kotz. He had the First Brigade of Colonel Robert West and Second Brigade of Colonel Samuel S. Samuel P. Spear. With some artillery as well. With some artillery with him as Jeez. well. And that's what the Union's got, what the Army of Northern Virginia got. Well, they got are obviously commanded by Robert E. Lee. First Corps under Lieutenant General Richard Anderson had Fields Division under Major General Charles Feed Field with uh, Gregg's Texas Brigade by Brigadier General John Gregg. Benning's Brigade ran by Colonel Dudley M. Dubois. Mm-hmm. Dubois? Dubois? But Dubois? Anderson's Brigade by Brigadier General George T. Anderson. Law's Brigade led by Colonel Pinckney D. Bowles. Law died, right? Yeah. And Bratton's Brigade under Brigadier General John Bratton. Take a look at their artillery, which is 1st Virginia Light Artillery Battalion, led by Lieutenant Colonel Robert Archelaus Hardaway. Then we got the North, then we got the Department of North Carolina and Southern Virginia, led by General PGT Beauregard. Hey. He has Hoke's Division, led by Major General Robert F. Hoke, with Klingman's Brigade, led by Colonel Hector M. McKethan. Colquitt's Brigade, led by Brigadier General Alfred Colquitt. Haggard's Brigade, led by Brigadier General Johnson Haggard. And Martin's Brigade, led by Brigadier General William W. Kirkland. Department of Richmond, led by Lieutenant General Richard Ewell, had the Division of uh, Defenses of Richmond, led by Johnson's Brigade, with Colonel John M. Hughes. John Hughes, huh? Yeah. Gary's Brigade, with Brigadier General Martin Gary. Then we have the Reserve Forces of Virginia, led by Major General James Kemper, with Barton's Division, led by Major General Seth Barton. He had the Local Defense, led by Brigadier General Patrick T. Moore, Barton City Brigade, led by Colonel Meriwether Lewis Clark Sr., Got an independent Richmond Infantry and an independent Richmond Cavalry in this little reserve forces of Virginia there. Got artillery defense led by Lieutenant Colonel John Pemberton. He has the 1st Division led by Lieutenant Colonel John Atkinson. 2nd Division led by Lieutenant Colonel James Howard. Lightfoot's Battalion led by Lieutenant Colonel J- uh, Charles Lightfoot. Stark's Battalion led by Major Alexander Stark. Chaffin's Bluff Battalion, led by Lieutenant Colonel John Minor Maury. Holy shit! There you go, guys! Jeez. So, keep up. <laughs> oh, a lot of guys man. here. Major General David Burney moved the 10th Corps north from the Deep Bottom Bridgehead toward the old Rebel Works atop New Market Heights, manned by Brigadier General John Grigg. A brigade of United States colored troops attacked the heights, but was repulsed. In this very attack, Christian Fleetwood's actions would later earn him the Medal of Honor. Good for you, Christian Fleetwood. Burney reinforced the assault force and stormed the heights again. Alfred Terry's division managed to turn the old rebel's left flank, thus turning the tide of this very battle. Word of Union success against Fort Harrison then reached Gregg, compelling him to pull Confederate troops back to Forts Gregg, Gilmer, and Johnson. Confederate defenders at Newmarket Heights were Lee's Grenadier Guards, the 1st, 4th, and 5th Texas, and 3rd Arkansas, numbering about 1,800 men. They inflicted 850 casualties on the attack and 13,000 Union, Union troops, while suffering only 50 themselves. Jeez. Once Bernie's troops had taken New Market Heights, the 10th Corps turned to the northwest along the New Market Road, moved against the secondary line of works guarding Richmond north of Fort Harrison. Uh-oh, are they going to go to Richmond? Uh-oh, Brigadier General Robert Sanford Foster's 10th Corps. They assaulted a small salient known as Fort Gilmer. David Bernie's brother, Brigadier General William Bernie, led a brigade of U.S. colored troops against Fort Gregg, south of Fort Gilmore. These attacks were marked by heroism among the colored troops, but they were ultimately repulsed. Mm-hmm. At about that same time, the other Bernies' first attack moved forward. The Union 18th Corps under Major General Edward Ord assaulted Fort Harrison to the west of New Market Heights. Ord's assault was led by Brigadier General George Stannard, which was a, he was a veteran of Gettysburg. <laughs> Stannard's men rushed across an open field and took cover in a slight depression just in front of the fort, and after a moment's rest, took the fort. The Confederate defenders broke to the rear, seeking refuge behind a secondary line. Brigadier General Haram Burnham was killed during the attack, oh, and the Union troops renamed the captured fort in his honor. Good for you guys, yeah. Fort Burnham. Fantastic. Once inside this very fort, though blue coats became disorganized, all three of Standard's brigade commanders were wounded or murdered. Oh. 
A supporting column under Brigadier General Charles Heckman veered far off to the north and was repulsed. Ord personally attempted to rally the troops to exploit the success, but he fell. But he, but he too fell with a critical wound. Mm. The loss of commanders and the presence of Confederate ironclads on the James put an end of the 18th Corps drive on Chaffin's Bluff alongside the James River. Well, Robert E. Lee realized the severity of the loss of Fort Harrison and personally brought ten personally brought ten thousand reinforcements Damn. under Major General Charles Field north from Petersburg. September 30th, he ordered a counterattack to retake Fort Harrison, which was now commanded by Major General Godfrey Whitesell, who replaced the wounded Ord. Confederate attacks were uncoordinated and were easily repulsed. They said, get out of here. What the hell? Well, just as Grant anticipated, the fighting around Chaffin's farm forced Lee to shift his resources and help the Union Army south of Petersburg win the Battle of People's Farm. Spoiler alert. All right. After uh, October, the two armies settled into trench warfare that continued until the end of the war. Yeah. The fighting around Chaffin's farm cost the nation nearly 5,000 casualties. What are we going to do with the battle? Well, the following men received the Medal of Honor for action in this battle. William Barnes, Joseph Shea, Paul Houghton Beatty, or Beatty James, or Thomas Belcher, James Bronson, George Buchanan, Nathan Huntley Edgerton, Christian Fleetwood, James Gardner, James Harris, Thomas Hawkins, Alfred Hilton, Milton Holland, Milton Hilton, <laughs> William Stone Hubble, Miles James, Franklin Jandro, Alexander Kelly, Nathaniel A. McCown, Robert A. Pinn, Edward Ratcliffe, John Schiller, Ebenezer Skelly, <laughs> that's a hell of a name, Charles Veal, and William Lang. Good for those guys, right? Three Medal of Honor recipients from the 6th U.S. Colored Infantry Regiment are depicted in a painting called Three Medals of Honor by artist Don Troiani. The painting was unveiled June 24, 2013 at the Union League of Philadelphia. Portrayed in the paint are Nathan Edgerton, Thomas Hawkins, and Alexander Kelly. Good for them. As of late 2021, the American Battlefield Trust and its partners have acquired and preserved 87 acres of the battlefield. All right. Well, there's prong one of the two-prong attack. Let's move on to prong two, which is Battle of Peoples' Farm, or it could be called Popular Springs Church or Popular Grove Church, whichever one you prefer. It was the western part of the simultaneous Union offensive, yes. Uh, September 1864, we already know, we planned simultaneous attacks, simultaneous. Eastern attack would be the uh, Chaffin's Farm, this western attack would be the Peoples' Farm, which was to be carried out by Union 5th Corps under Major General Gouverneur Warren oh. and a cavalry division under Brigadier General David Gregg right. with units from the 9th Corps and the 2nd Corps in support. Look at that. Uh, Union Army, Army of the Potomac, consisted of the 2nd Corps with 3rd Division Major General Gorsham Mott. He had the brigades of 1st Brigade, uh, Brigadier General Regis de Trobiand. Look at a French man. 2nd Brigade of Brigadier General Byron Pierce. 3rd Brigade of Colonel Robert McAllister. Mm -hmm. Then you had the 5th Corps, which is Major General Gouverneur Warren, his division of uh, Brigadier General Charles Griffin's 1st Division, which he had the 1st Brigade of Colonel Horatio Sickle. Second Brigade of Edgar Colonel Edgar Gregory, Third Brigade of Colonel James Gwynn. Then you had the Second Division with Brigadier General Roman B. Ayers, which he had the First Brigade of Lieutenant Colonel Elwell S. Otis, Major General James G. Grindley, Second Brigade of Colonel Samuel A. Graham, Third Brigade of uh, Colonel Arthur H. Grimshaw. Grimshaw. Then you had the Third Division, which is the Third Brigade under Colonel J. William Hoffman. Artillery, you had the ninth, the ninth Corps, Major General John no. G. Park. Mm -mm. The 5th Corps has an artillery oh, division. And the 5th Corps had its own artillery division. Who knows who's manning that. Right. Then you had the 9th Corps under Major General John G. Pock. He had a division of 1st Division Brigadier General Orlando B. Wilcox, who had the 1st Brigade. Colonel Samuel Harriman, 2nd Brigade of Brigadier General John Hartramp. 3rd Brigade of Colonel Napoleon B. McLaughlin. Then you had the 2nd Division under Brigadier General Robert B. Potter. 1st Brigade, Colonel John I. Curtin. 2nd Brigade, Br Brigadier General Simon Griffin. And Artillery Brigade, which had Lieutenant Colonel J. Albert Monroe commanding that. Then you got some Cavalry Corps, which is commanded by 2nd Division Brigadier General David McMurtry Gregg. He had the 1st Brigade of Brigadier General Henry E. Davies, Jr. 2nd Brigade of Colonel Charles H. Smith. All right, I get Northern Virginia once again, huh? Well, they're going to bring in the Third Corps under Lieutenant General A.P. Hill. We've got Henry Heath's division, which is Heath's division. Brigadier General Joseph Davis leads Davis's brigade. 
John Rogers Crook, Brigadier General, leads Crook's Cook's Brigade. <clears throat> Brigadier General William McRae leads McRae's Brigade. Colonel R. M. Mayo leads Archer and Triple H's Walker's Brigades. Mm. Colonel William McComb leads Johnson's Brigade. See, I like these guys. They just name their brigades after their people instead of the right. uh, Roman numeral fucking 130 brigade or some shit. Well, Major General Cadmus M. Wilcox lead Wilcox's division. They had Brigadier General James H. Lane lead in Lane's brigade. Brigadier General Alfred M. Scales lead in Scales's brigade. Brigadier General Sam- Samuel McGowan lead in McGowan's brigade. Brigadier General Edward L. Thomas lead in Thomas's brigade. We've got a cavalry corps led by Major General Wade Hampton III, who has WHF Lee's division, uh, led by Major General WHF Lee. Uh, he had the brigades of Beringer's brigade, led by Brigadier General Rufus Beringer. Richard L. T. Beale led Beale's brigade. Brigadier General James Darren led Jar- Darren's brigade. Then we have Butler's division, led by Major General Matthew Calbrath Butler, who had Butler's brigade, his own brigade, led by Colonel H.A. H.K. Aiken, and Young's Brigade, led by Colonel J.F. Warren. Cool. Holy shit. Shit. Uh, General Grant had two intentions for Warren. First, attack the opposite end of Lee's line to relieve pressure on Fort Harrison, which Butler's forces had captured and were holding against uh, counterattacks. The second was to take advantage of the units Lee had removed from his right to retake Fort Harrison. Warren's attack was aimed at the fortifications guarding the Boyton Plank Road, which was being used to carry supplies into Petersburg from the Confederate railhead at Stony Creek to the south. Well, this line was being extended to reach the vicinity of the Union flank at Globe Tavern. While the lines were being constructed, a temporary line was held along the Squirrel Level Road. September 30th, the same day Lee was attempting to retake Fort Harrison, Warren and Gregg began marching along the Poplar Springs Road towards the Squirrel Level Line in their area of Peoples' Farm and Poplar Springs Church. Lee had indeed pulled forces from his flank for the counterattack on Fort Harrison, including the Light Division under Major General Cadmus Wilcox. So Warren was marching against Lieutenant General A.P. Hill's reduced court. Around 1 p.m., Brigadier General Charles Griffin led the attack against the old rebels near the Poplar Springs Church. Griffin quickly captured Fort Archer on the extreme Confederate flank, and the squirrel-level line broke and fled so quickly that prisoners captured were minimal. Warren halted the attack to fortify the new position and not advance too far into front of the Ninth Corps. All right, the Union attack force lead to recall the Light Division from its march towards Fort Harrison. Other than Scales' brigade, which proceeded to Fort Harrison, was temporarily attached to General Hoke's force. The Ninth Corps, under Major General John Park, moved up on Warren's left but did not make an effective link with the Fifth Corps flank. Major General Henry Heath was preparing to make a counterattack which came about 4.30 p.m. and routed the 9th Corps and forced one of his brigades to surrender. Warren, who had originally feared a counterattack, now helped rally the broken 9th Corps units and check Heath's attack, and the fighting died down. Heath, he tried another flank attack on the following day, which was repulsed at the Battle of Vaughn Road. As was a cavalry attack under Major General Wade Hampton. 2nd of October, the Union position was reinforced by Brigadier General Gresham Mott's division from the 2nd Corps. Mott, he spearheaded a Union attack that day, which was aimed for the Boyden Plank Road. The attack easily overran Fort McRae, but was checked before it reached the Boyden Plank Road. <laughs> Look at that. Well, the Confederate defenders lost works on both sides of the lines. The Union Army extended the siege lines past the Peebles' farm area, bringing them all the closer to the ultimate goal of the Boyden Plank Road. The Union Army was firmly entrenched in the area, and later that month, the Second Corps would make an attempt to cut the Boyden Plank Road. Civil War Trust and its partners have acquired and preserved 90 acres of the battlefield through November 2021. The acreage is located within Pamplin Historical Park outside of Petersburg, Virginia. Okay. Look at them. Got their siege lines even more uh, longer. So, pretty much, bye-bye, Richmond. Bye-bye, war. Yep. All but over. Should have been a long time ago. Moving on to the first Battle of Saltville, happened on the 2nd of October, 1864. It was fought near the town of Saltville, Virginia. The battle was over a significant Confederate salt works in the town. It was fought by both regular and home guard Confederate units against the United States U.S. Army, which included two of the few black cavalry units of the United States colored troops. Ooh. The importance of the small Smythe County Mountain town of Saltville to the Confederate war effort cannot be overemphasized. During the 19th century, the only effective way to preserve salt to preserve meat was by salting it, 
and salt produced at Saltville accounted for up to two-thirds of the salt used by the Confederacy. Oh. Saltville's inaccessibility and the strong Confederate presence in the area made its capture difficult for most of the war. Oh, no shit. Well, by September 1864, Union Major General Stephen Burnbridge uh, received permission from his commanding officers to prepare a raid into southwestern Virginia with the goal of disrupting salt production at Saltville. Included in his 5,200-man force were men of the newly formed 5th United States Colored Cavalry. Hearing of the Union advance, uh, Brigadier General John Ickles, the officer charged with Saltville's defenses, traveled to the nearby town of Abingdon to acquire more troops to supplement his tiny 400-man garrison. Oh, shit. He successfully recruited 2,000 troops stationed in the area, and he learned that John C. Breckenridge was on his way back to Saltville from Shenandoah with another 1,551 men. Good for him, huh? Well, back at Saltville, Brigadier General Alfred E. Jackson, known as Mudwall Jackson for his poor service record, mm-hmm. right, fortified the town in the face of Burbridge's approach. October 2nd, 1864, Burbridge's soldiers encountered Jackson's pickets three miles from town. Fortunately for the Confederates, reinforcements arrived just in time. Artillery dueled across the ridges that surrounded Saltville throughout the day as 5,200 Union soldiers assaulted around 2,800 Confederates. Oh, shit. Heavy infantry fight and sending around a ford along the north branch of the Holston River. Union troops slowly advanced, but expended much of their ammo against the entrenched ribs. Receiving word from General Sherman that his men were needed in Middle Tennessee, Burbridge, he withdrew hurriedly during the hours of during the early hours of the third of October without accomplishing the destruction of the salt works, mm. leaving wounded men strewn across the battlefield. Wow, there's leaving guys, huh? Well, the battle was obviously a Confederate victory. It's become known primarily, though, for the Confederate massacre afterward of white and black Union U.S. Army troops. Both Confederate soldiers and irregular guerrilla forces under the notorious Champ Ferguson murdered white and black U.S. Army soldiers on the battlefield, and later some wounded who were being treated at the field hospital set up at nearby Emory and Henry College. U.S. Army surgeon reported that five to seven black soldiers and Elsa Smith, a white lieutenant, were murdered at that hospital. Oh, shit, these assholes. <laughs> Confederate Brigadier General Felix Houston Robertson had bragged to another officer that he had killed nearly all the Negroes. William C. Davis, in his book, An Honorable Defeat, The Last Days of the Confederate Government, he wrote that in 2001, he says that the Robertson personally joined in the act of villainy, although he escaped prosecution. When General Lee learned of Robertson's conduct, he communicated to General John Breckinridge, commander of the Department of East Tennessee and West Virginia, his dismay that a general officer should have been guilty of the crime you mentioned, mm-hmm. and instructed Breckinridge to prefer charges against him and bring him to trial. Look at you. Well, estimates of the number of men massacred at Saltville vary, of course they do, with most sources indicating around 50. Thomas Mays, in his book The Saltville Massacre in 95, argued that 46 U.S. Army soldiers were killed. An analysis of the National Archives records by Bryce Sudero, Phyllis Brown, and David Brown concluded that 45 to 50 members of the 5th and 6th U.S. Colored Cavalry were murdered by Confederates. Dang, you savages. Author William Marvel, he'd early analyzed the same records and concluded in 1991 that five black soldiers, wounded and helpless, were definitely murdered at Saltville on the 3rd of October, 1864. And as many as seven more may have suffered the same fate that day. So he's only saying 12? Right. The Confederates may have murdered as many as two dozen U.S. Army men. Jeez. Felix Houston Robertson was never tried for his role in the massacre. He died on April 20th, 1928, an old man of 89. However, Champ Ferguson did stand trial immediately after the war. He was tried by a military court in Nashville, Tennessee for this and other non-military killings. Oh, shit. He was found guilty of 22 murders and sentenced to death by hanging. Executed Tennessee State Prison. October 29th, 1865. Damn. Well, Second Battle of Saltville took place two months later at Saltville, which we'll get to. Civil War Trust and its partners have acquired and preserved 107 acres of those battlefields as of today. Look at that, man. <clears throat> Only massacres we've seen so far are by the uh, rebels. Uh-huh. We've seen two or three from the Union. No. Yes, we have. Nope. Yes, we have. Oh, nope, just the Rebs massacring people nonchalantly. That's not true. Yep. Union did it, too. I don't think so. Yep. Nope. Raided and burned whole towns. 
and not, killed the men. Not killing people. No, you know, that was, that was yes, the Confederate. Did. That was oh, the Confederate. Yes, they did. Yeah, I don't think, don't think so, but yes, they did. I don't think they might have uh, burned and looted towns, but didn't massacre anybody. Raped the women. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> That'll do it for us. And these uh, four battles: Mariana, Chapin's Farms, Peoples' Farm, and First Saltville. Pretty interesting stuff. Decent. Petersburg got extended uh, siege lines. So, like I said, Richmond pretty much gone, taken out. Lee's army's gone for the remainder of the war. Sucks to be them. Yeah, it's over. They should have gave up at, Get- at Gettysburg. Next week, we have the Battle of Alatoona in Georgia, the Battle of Darbytown in New Market in Virginia. The Battle of Tom's Brook in Virginia, and most likely the Battle of Darbytown Road in Virginia. They should have uh, surrendered when Stonewall was murdered by his own men. Their best general. Chattahoochee or something like that? Battle of Chattahoochee? No Chancellorsville, but yeah. Chancellorsville? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We'll have those four battles. Then we'll have another three probably the week after that before we get to uh, another big battle of Cedar Creek. They should have ended the war after the first battle. <laughs> <laughs> it was only going to go downhill from there, huh? <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> well, uh, make sure you guys go subscribe to our YouTube channel at Bang Dang Network, as well as our Dart League channel, uh, Liquor Shuffle on Dart League. Both of those will be in the description below. Leave us a like, review, subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple. Answer that Spotify question. We'll be back next week for more Battles of the Americans of War. We are the Mother Music Anders. We. Bang Dang.